Hi friends and welcome to the Feather Cottage with Dee. Today we are reading chapter 15 of Battlefield of the Mind by Joyce Meyer. And I'm going to tell you friends, Satan messed with me so hard in trying to read this. Uh, this has been a real struggle to get this video made and I'm only doing half the chapter. Um, this chapter is a very long chapter and where I end there's still seven pages left to read. So we'll do the last half of this chapter the following week. But please pay attention if you're listening to it because there's a message for somebody. I'm not sure who, but there's a message in this part for somebody that Satan did not want to hear. So I'm going to begin the reading and I thank you for joining us and I will see you on Wednesday uh, at 2 Eastern, 1 Central. For the discussion of this first half of chapter 15. Bye bye. For who has known or understood the mind, the counsel and purpose of the Lord, so as to guide and instruct him and give him knowledge? But we have the mind of Christ, the Messiah, and do hold the thoughts, feelings, and purposes of his heart. 1 Corinthians 2.16 I believe that you have now made a firm decision to choose the right thoughts, so let's look at the type of thinking that would be considered right according to the Lord. There are certainly many types of thoughts that would have been considered unthinkable to Jesus when he was on the earth. If we want to follow in his footsteps, then we must begin to think as he did. Right away, you're probably thinking, that's impossible, Joyce. Jesus was perfect. I may be able to improve my thinking, but I will never be able to think as he did. Well, the Bible tells us that we have the mind of Christ and a new heart and spirit. A new heart and spirit. A new heart will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statute, and you shall heed my ordinances and do them. Ezekiel 36, 26, 27. As Christians, you and I have a new nature, which is actually the nature of God, deposited in us at the new birth. We can see from this scripture that God knew if we were to heed his ordinances and walk in his statute, that he would have to give us his spirit and a new heart and mind. Romans 8, 6 speaks of the mind and the flesh and tells us that death is a result of following mind of the flesh and life is the result of following the mind of the spirit. We would make tremendous progress simply by learning how to discern life and death. If something is ministering death to you, don't do it any longer. When certain lines of thought fill you full of death, every kind of misery, you know immediately that is not the mind of the spirit. To illustrate, let's say I am thinking about an un unjust I suffered because of another person, and I begin to get angry. I start thinking about how much I dislike that individual. If I am discerning, I will notice that I am being filled with death. I am getting upset, tense, stressed out. May even be experiencing physical discomfort. Headache, stomach pain, or undue fatigue may be the fruit of my wrong thinking. On the other hand, if I am thinking how blessed I am, how good God has been to me, I will also discern that I am being filled with life. It is very helpful to a believer to learn to discern life and death within himself. Jesus has made arrangements for us to be filled with life by putting his own mind in us. We can choose to flow in the mind of Christ. In the following pages of this chapter is a list of things to do in order to flow in the mind of Christ. Step 1. Think positive thoughts. Do two walk together except they make an appointment and have agreed? Amos 3.3 3. 
If a person is thinking according to the mind of Christ, what will his thoughts be like? They will be positive, that's for sure. In an earlier chapter, we have already discussed the absolute necessity of positive thinking. You may even want to go back to chapter 5 at this point and refresh your memory on the importance of being positive. I just went back and reread it and God blessed myself, even though I wrote it. Enough can never be said about the power of being positive. God is positive, and if you and I want to flow with Him, we must get on the same wavelength and begin to think positively. I'm not talking about an exercising mind control, but simply being an all-around positive person. Have a positive outlook and a positive attitude. Maintain positive thoughts and expectations. Engage in positive conversation. Jesus certainly displayed a positive outlook and attitude. He endured many difficulties, including personal attacks, being lied about, being deserted by his disciples when he needed them most, being made fun of, being lonely, misunderstood, and a host of other discouraging things. Yet in the midst of all these negatives, he remained positive. He always had an uplifting comment, an encouraging word, and he always gave hope to all those he came near. The mind of Christ in us is positive. Therefore, any time we become negative, we are not operating in the mind of Christ. Millions of people suffer from what I call the downs in life. Discouragement, depression, and despair. But I do not think it is possible to be in a down mood without being negative, unless the cause is medical. Even in that case, being negative will only increase the problem and its symptoms. When a person is down in his mood, everything about him is down. His head hangs down, and the corners of his mouth turn down, his eyes are droopy, his shoulders slump down, and he usually wants to sit down or lie down. According to Psalms 3.3, God is our glory and the lifter of our heads. He wants to lift everything, our hopes, our attitudes, our moods, our heads, hands, and hearts, our whole life. He is our divine lifter. God wants to lift us up, and the devil wants to press us down. Satan uses the negative events and situations of our life to depress us. The dictionary defines the word depress is to lower the spirit, sadden. According to Webster, something that is depressed is sunken below the surrounding region, hollow. Depressed means to sink, to press down, or to hold below ground level. We regularly have the opportunity to think negative thoughts, but they only press, down, press us down further. But negative won't solve our problems. It will only add to them. Overcome Depression Psalms 143, 3-10 gives a description of depression and how to overcome it. Let's look at this passage in detail to see the steps we can take to overcome this attack of the enemy. 1. Identify the nature and cause of the problem. For the enemy has pursued and persecuted my soul. He has crushed my life down to the ground. He has made me to dwell in dark places as those who have been long dead. Psalms 143, 3. Dwelling in dark places as one who is long dead certainly sounds to me like a description of someone who is as down as he can be. Notice that the cause or source of this depression this attack upon the soul is Satan. Number two, recognize the depression steals life and light. Therefore is my spirit overwhelmed and faint within me, wrapped in gloom. My heart within my bosom grows numb. Psalms 143.4 Depression oppresses a person's spiritual freedom and power. Our spirit, empowered and encouraged by God's spirit, is powerful and free. Therefore, Satan seeks to oppress its power and liberty by filling our mind with darkness and gloom. Please realize that it is vital to resist the feeling called depression. 
immediately upon sensing its arrival. The longer it is allowed to remain, the harder it becomes to resist. Number three, remember the good times. I remember the days of old. I meditate on all your doings. I ponder the works of your hands. Psalms 143, 5. In this verse, we see the palmist responding to his condition. Remembering, meditating, and pondering are all the functions of the mind. He obviously knows that his thoughts will affect his feelings. So he gets busy thinking about the kind of things that will help him overcome the attack upon his mind. Number four, praise the Lord in the midst of the problem. I spread forth my hands to you. My soul thirsts after you like a thirsty land for water. Selah, pause and calmly think of that. Psalms 143, 6. The palmist knows the importance of praise. He lifts his hands in worship. He declares that his need truly is. He needs God. Only the Lord can cause him to feel satisfied. Far too often when people get depressed, it is because they are in the need of something, and they seek it in the wrong places, which only adds to their problems. In Jeremiah 2.13, the Lord said, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, and they have hewn for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns which cannot hold water. God alone can water a thirsty soul. Do not be deceived into thinking that anything else can satisfy you fully and completely. Chasing after the wrong things will always leave you disappointed, and disappointment opens the door for depression. Number five. Ask for God's help. Answer me speedily, O Lord, for my spirit fails. Hide not your face from me, lest I become like those who go down into the pit, the grave. Psalms 143, 7. The psalmist asks for help. He's basically saying, hurry up, God, because I'm not going to be able to hold on very much longer without you. Number six, listen to the Lord. Cause me to hear your loving kindness in the morning, for on you do I lean, and you I do trust. Cause me to know the way within I should walk, for I lift up my inner self to you. Psalms 143.8 The psalmist knows that he needs to hear from God. He needs to be assured of God's love and kindness. He needs God's attention and direction. Number seven, pray for deliverance. Deliver me, O Lord, from my enemies. I flee to you to hide me. Psalms 143, 9. Once again, the psalmist is declaring that it is only God who can help him. Please notice that throughout this discourse, he is keeping his mind on God, not on the problem. Number 8. Seek God's wisdom, knowledge, and leadership. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Let your good spirit lead me into the level country, into the land of uprightness. Psalms 143.10 Perhaps the psalmist has indicated that he has gotten out of the will of God and thus opened the door for an attack on his soul. He wants to be in God's will, for he now realizes that it is the only safe place to be. Then he requests that God help him to be stable. I believe his phrase, God lead me to level country, refers to his unsettled emotions. He wants to be level, not up and down. Use your weapons, for the weapons of our warfare are not physical weapons of flesh and blood. They are mighty before God for the overthrow and the destruction of strongholds. As in as much as we refute arguments, theories, and reasoning, and with proud and lofty things that set itself up against the true knowledge of God. And we lead every thought and purpose away captive into the obedience of Christ the Messiah, the Anointed One. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5. Satan uses depression and all other downs in life to drag millions into the pit of darkness and despair. Suicide is often the result of depression. 
A suicidal person is usually one who has become so negative that he sees absolutely no hope for the future. Remember, negative feelings come from negative thoughts. The mind is the battlefield. The place where the battle is won or lost. Choose today to be positive, casting down every negative imagination and bringing your thoughts into the obedience of Jesus Christ. See Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 10.5 Step 2. Be God-minded. You will guard him and keep him in perfect and constant peace, whose mind, both in inclination and its character, is stayed on you, because he commits himself to you, leans on you, and hopes confidently in you. Isaiah 26, 3. Jesus had a continual fellowship with his Heavenly Father. It is impossible to have full fellowship with anyone without having your mind on that individual. If my husband and I are in the car together and he is talking to me, but I have my mind on something else, we are not really fellowshipping because I did not give him my full attention. Therefore, I believe we can safely say that the thoughts of a person functioning in the mind of Christ will be on God and on all his mighty work. Meditate on God and his works. My whole being shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise you with joyful lips. When I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in my night watch, Psalm 63, 5, 6. I will meditate also upon all your works and consider all your mighty deeds, Psalms 77, 12. I will meditate on your precepts and have respect to your ways, the path of life marked out by your law, Psalms 119, 15. I remember the days of old. I will meditate on all your doings. I will ponder the works of your hands, Psalms 143, 5. The psalmist, David, spoke frequently about meditating on God, His goodness and His works and ways. It is tremendously uplifting to think of the goodness of God and all the marvelous works of His hands. I enjoy watching television shows about nature, animals, ocean life, etc. because they depict the greatness and the awesomeness of God in His infinite capacity and how He is upholding all things by the might of His power. See Hebrews 1, 3. Meditating on God and His ways and His works will need to become a regular part of your thought life if you want to experience victory. One of my favorite verses of scripture is Psalm 17, 15, in which the psalmist says to the Lord, I shall be fully satisfied when I wake to find myself beholding your form and I have sweet communion with you. I spent a lot of unhappy days because I started thinking about all the wrong things the minute I woke up each morning. I can truly say that I am much more satisfied since the Holy Spirit has helped me operate out of the mind of Christ, the mind of the Spirit that is, in, that is within me. Fellowship with God early in the morning is one sure way to start each day right and to begin enjoying life. Fellowship with the Lord. If I do not go away, the Comforter, Counselor, Helper, Advocate, Intercessor, Strengthener, Standby, will not come to you into close fellowship with you. But if I go away, I will send him to you to be in close fellowship with you. John 16, 7. These words were spoken by Jesus just before he departed into heaven where he is seated at the right hand of the Father in glory. It is obvious from this scripture that it is God's will that we be in close fellowship with him. Nothing is closer to us than our own thoughts. Therefore, if we fill our mind with the Lord, it will bring Him into our consciousness, and we will begin to enjoy fellowship with Him that will bring joy, peace, and victory into our everyday life. He is always with us, just as He promised He would be. See Matthew 28, 20, and Hebrews 13, 5. But we will not be conscious of His presence unless we think about Him. I can be in a room with someone, and if I have my mind on lots of other things, I can leave and never even know that person was there. This is the way it is with our fellowship privileges with the Lord. He is always with us, 
but we need to think on him and be aware of his presence. Step three, B, God loves me minded. And we know, understand, recognize, and are conscious of the obvious and by experience, believe and adhere to and put faith in and rely on the love God cherishes for us. God is love, and he who dwells and continues in love dwells and continues in God, and God dwells and continues in him. 1 John 4.16 I've learned that the same thing is true of God's love that is true of his presence. If we never meditate on his love for us, we will never experience it. Paul prayed in Ephesians 3 that the people would experience the love of God for themselves. The Bible says that he loves us. But how many of God's children still lack the revelation concerning God's love? I remember when I began my ministry. The first week I was to conduct a meeting. I asked the Lord what he wanted me to teach, and he responded, Tell my people that I love them. They all know that, I said. I want to teach them something really powerful. Not a Sunday school lesson out of John 3.16. The Lord said to me, very few of my people really know how much I love them. If they did, they would act differently. As I began to study the subject of receiving God's love, I realized that I was in desperate need myself. The Lord led me in my study to 1 John 4.16, which states that we would be conscious of God's love. That means it should be something we are actively aware of. I had been unconscious, vague sort of understanding that God loved me, but the love of God is meant to be powerful force in our lives, one that will take us through even the most difficult trials into victory. In Romans 8:35, the Apostle Paul exhorts us, who shall ever separate us from Christ's love? Shall suffering or affliction or tribulation or calamity or distress or persecution or hunger or disillusion or peril of sword. Then in verse 37 he goes on to say, Yet, aimed at all these, we are more than conquerors and gain a surpassing victory through him who loves us. I stood in this area for a long time and I became conscious and aware of God's love for me through thinking about his love and by confessing it out loud. I learned scripture about the love of God and I meditated on them and confessed them out of my mouth. I did this over and over for months, and all the time the revelation of his unconditional love for me was becoming more and more of a reality to me. Now his love is so real to me that even in hard times, I am comforted by the conscious knowing that he loves me and that I no longer have to live in fear. Fear not, there is no fear in love, but perfect love chest out fear. 1 John 4.18 God loves us perfectly, just as we are. Romans 5.8 tells us that God commandeth his love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Believers operating of the mind of Christ are not going to think about how terrible they are. They will have righteous space thoughts. They should have righteous conscience, meditating regularly on who you are in Christ. We do not have the right standing with God because we do everything right, but because he gave us right standing as a gift of his grace. When received by faith, the gift of righteousness will, become, will begin to produce more and more right behavior. Be righteousness conscious, not sin conscious. For our sake he made Christ virtually to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in and through him we might become endured with viewed as being in and examples of the righteousness of God, what we ought to be approved and acceptable and in right relationship with him by his goodness. 2 Corinthians 5.21 A large number of believers are tormented by negative thinking about themselves. Thoughts about how God must be so displeased with them because of all their weakness and failures. How much time do you waste living under guilt and condemnation? Notice I said, how much time do you waste? Because that is exactly what all kinds of things... 
I want to reread that. I'm so sorry I got choked. It says, how much time do you waste living under guilt and condemnation? Notice I said, how much time do you waste? Because that is exactly what all that kind of thinking is. A waste of time. Friends, I want to stop here for a second and tell you, whatever is being read to you right now must have some type of major importance because Satan has tried and tried and tried to keep me from reading this page to you. I have now re-recorded this five times and for some reason I keep having to re-record. So if I get the rest of it out, please pay attention to it because it's something Satan is not wanting us to hear. She continues, don't think about how terrible you were before you came to Christ. Instead, think about how you've been made the righteousness of God in Him. Remember, thoughts turn into actions. If you ever want to behave any better, you have to change your thinking first. Keep thinking how terrible you are and you will only act worse. Every time a negative, condemning thought comes to your mind, remind yourself that God loves you that you have been made the righteousness of God in Christ. That was the paragraph I have reread five times. So somewhere in that message is for somebody listening. Please, please remember what it just said. She continues, you are changing for the better all the time. Every day you're growing spiritually. God has a glorious plan for your life. These are the truths you must think on. This is what you are supposed to be doing with your mind. Think deliberately according to the Word of God. Don't just think whatever falls into your head, receiving it as your own thoughts. Rebuke the devil and start going forward by thinking right thoughts. Step 4. Have an exhortive mind. He who exhorts encourages to his exhortation. Romans 12, 8. The person with the mind of Christ thinks positive, uplifting, edifying thoughts about other people as well about himself and his own circumstance. The ministry of exhortation is greatly needed in the world today. You will never extort anyone with your words if you have not first had kind thoughts about that individual. Remember that whatever is in your heart will come out of your mouth. Do some love thinking on purpose. Send thoughts of love toward other people. Speak words of encouragement to them. Vine's Exploratory Dictionary of Old and New Testament Words defines the Greek word parkeo, which is translated exhort, as primarily to call a person to admonish, exhort, or to urge one to pursue some course of conduct. I interpret this definition to mean coming alongside a person and urging him to press forward in pursuing a course of action. The ministerial gift of exhortation spoken in Romans 12.8 can readily be seen in those who have it. They are always saying something encouraging or uplifting to everyone, something that makes others feel better and encourages them to press on. We may not all have the ministry gift of exhortation, but anyone can learn to be encouraging. The simple rule is, it is not good, then don't think it or say it. Everyone has enough problems already. We don't need to add to their troubles by tearing them down. We should build up one another in love, Ephesians 4.29. Don't forget, love always believes the best in everyone. See 1 Corinthians 13.7. As you begin to think lovely thoughts about people, you will find them behaving in a more lovely manner. Thoughts and words are containers or weapons for carrying creative and destructive power. They can be used against Satan and his works, or they can actually help him in his plan of destruction. Let's say that you have a child who has some behavior problems and definitely needs to change. You pray for him and ask God to work in his life making whatever changes are necessary. Now what do you do with your thoughts and words concerning him during the waiting period? 
Many people never see the answer to their prayers because they navigate what they have asked for with their own thoughts and words before God ever gets a chance to work on their behalf. Do you pray for your child to change and then entertain all kinds of negative thoughts about him? Or perhaps pray for change and then think and even say to others, this kid will never change. To live in victory, you must begin to line up your thoughts with God's Word. We are not walking in the Word if our thoughts are opposed to what it says. We are not walking in the Word if we are not thinking in the Word. When you pray for someone, line up your thoughts and words with what you have prayed, and you will begin to see a breakthrough. I am not suggesting that you get out of balance and refuse to acknowledge that their problem exists. If your child has a behavior problem in school and a friend asks how he's doing, what should you do if, in reality, no change has been manifest? You can say, well, we have not seen the breakthrough yet, but I believe God is working and we will see change soon. Step 5. Develop a thankful mind. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and a thank offering and into his courts with praise. Be thankful and say so to him. Bless and affectionately praise his name. Psalms 104 A person flowing in the mind of Christ will find his thoughts filled with praise and thanksgiving. Many doors are open to the enemy through complaining. Some people are physically ill and live weak, powerless lives due to the disease called complaining that attacks the thoughts and conversations of people. A powerful life cannot be lived without thanksgiving. The Bible instructs us over and over in the principles of thanksgiving. Complaining in thought or word is the death of principle, but being thankful and saying so is the life of principle. If a person does not have a thankful heart, mind, thanksgiving will not come out of his mouth, but when we are thankful, we will say so. Friends, I'm going to break this chapter into two parts. I have already read several pages, and there are still seven to go. So we're going to break this into two, two parts, and we will continue the second half of it next week. Well, I thank you for sticking around if you have to the end of what I've done so far. And I appreciate all your love and support. Um... This is a message Satan is really trying to keep us from receiving. Uh, it just blows my mind how much he tries to mess with it. Well, I'm going to tell you all to have a blessed week, and I will see you Wednesday at 2 Eastern, 1 Central, uh, for the live, and we'll discuss the first half of Chapter 15. Y'all have a great and blessed day. Talk to you later. Bye.